Welcome back to 12 Days in March. In this recording, Dr. McGinnis will pick up his discussion of electrophysiology, moving on from the action potential to myocyte contraction. So that's all very interesting, but um, let's talk about the myocytes themselves and what is going on there. So, what I want you to do now is we're going to take a couple of different views of cardiac myocytes. We're going to zoom in and zoom out at different levels. So we're starting relatively zoomed out here. So this is an example, this whole thing is an example of a myocyte, a cardiac myocyte. And contained within the myocyte, it's important to understand the anatomy because that in turn kind of dictates the physiology a little bit. So you have these bundles of elements of the myocyte. These are called myofibrils hanging around all these myofibrils. Well, so first of all, within the myofibrils, that's where you get your actin and myosin elements. And those are going to be the elements of the cell that are responsible for actually making muscle contraction occur. So this is where your actin and myosin are located, buried within a myofibril, which in turn is buried within a, a myocyte. You have mitochondria that are hanging out that help to deliver a lot of the energy required for the process of, of uh, myocyte contraction. And then also, woven like a web throughout all of these different myofibrils, you have the structure called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And we'll talk more about what that's for, um, but it relates to storage and delivery of calcium. So uh, interwoven with all of this stuff is where your sarcoplasmic reticulum hangs out. And then you have these sort of like mine shaft-like structures called T-tubules that sort of run along the myocyte and from the surface of the myocyte sort of deliver this tunnel deep down within the myocyte itself. So you have this kind of structure, you've got this sort of sarcoplasmic reticulum hanging out with everything, you have these uh, sort of deep diving T-tubules, and all of these things are going to wind up sort of playing a role in how the myocyte actually gets the job done. So now we're going to zoom in. So we were looking at the, at the myocyte in total. Now what we're going to do is we're going to kind of dive in and get to like an individual myofibril with a T-tubule kind of hanging out right here. So this is, you could think of it as sort of the myofibril membrane up here. And basically what happens in order for myocyte contraction to occur, you have a wave front of depolarization that comes down this cell membrane here. So all the stuff that we were just talking about before, those ion flows, potassium, sodium rushing out, potassium rushing in, that's happening like right here, right before our very eyes on the membrane. As that wave front of, of depolarization sort of comes along, it enters into the T-tubule, and the whole purpose of the T-tubule is just helping to deliver the wave front of depolarization throughout that sort of complex structure of all these myofibrils. So we have the T-tubule to help get the message all throughout the, the myocyte. And we had talked a little bit about how there's this influx of calcium that occurs, not a major ion flow per se, but very important for what goes on uh, in terms of the cell physiology. So when calcium fluxes into the cell as part of that wavefront of depolarization, as part of the cellular depolarization process, you get these calcium ions come rushing into the, to the muscle cell and they interact with this thing right here, with the sarcoplasmic reticulum, and in particular, this receptor that's hanging out on the surface of the sarcoplasmic reticulum. And that receptor is called the rhinidine receptor. This is one of these kind of like sort of buzzwords, things that maybe are coming back to you from like cell biology and things that I definitely never understood until Howard Sachs brow beat me into doing this course. So here's the rhinidine receptor. I'm just kidding, Howard. Here's the rhinidine receptor. This is important because calcium comes along, it interacts with the rhinidine receptor, and then we get the often talked about, rarely understood process of calcium-induced calcium release. So calcium comes, interacts with the rhinidine receptor. The sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is like a calcium bank, releases, effuses all of this calcium. Now you have all this calcium hanging out in sort of the cytosolic space here. And the calcium, in turn, is now able to interact with the actin-myosin arrangement down here and uh, allow for myocyte contraction to actually take place. So that is kind of the process by which the message goes from coming along the surface of the cell membrane to actually getting into the subcellular elements of the cell that are going to allow for muscle contraction to actually happen. Everybody good with that so far? Okay. And so the last phase, zooming in even further, so remember we started out here, we zoomed in, 
and to the cell membrane type level along the, the T-tubule. And now we're zooming in even further to really take a look at the actin and myosin, or well, primarily in this case, the actin filament. So what you need to know here is that, uh, coming back to this idea of, of calcium binding and how calcium is important, so the actin filament is kind of hanging out. It's waiting for myosin to come along and start to sort of walk down that filament and, and make the contraction happen. Actin has these binding sites for myosin all along its uh, length. Those uh, binding sites for myosin are covered over by this structure called tropomyosin. So in the resting state, this kind of tropomyosin structure is covering over the binding sites of actin. And along the tropomyosin, are these things called troponin complexes. When they're actually working nine to five, they're part of tropomyosin, hanging out here, waiting for calcium to come along and bind to the troponin complex. And when that occurs, when calcium comes, binds to troponin, it triggers this conformational change in the tropomyosin that exposes the binding sites for myosin uh, along the actin filament. So we get this conformational change that occurs. The myosin binding sites are now exposed, and myosin is able to sort of walk down the actin filament and, and, and allow contraction to occur. Everybody sort of good with that? So you can see there's this whole kind of sequence of steps that is needed in order for contraction to take place. It does take place. It does work. This is what happens, and the result is hopefully strong contraction of the myocardium. Now, I realize at this point you're probably all thinking it would be difficult for this content to get less exciting, but I'm pleased to, I'm pleased to tell you that that is not the case because we're, gonna, we're forging ahead. We're going uh, to talk about this. So um, again, here are these actin filaments that we had talked about before. These are the things that are wrapped up with tropomyosin and have the binding sites for myosin uh, that's right here. Okay, And as you can see, these actin and myosin filaments, they're sort of, they're all, you know, arranged in this kind of alternating train track type of uh, format here. And basically, a couple of labels that are important to understand. So the length of the myosin filament, the total length of the myosin filament there, called the A-band, is the length of the myosin filament. The I-band is the space in between those myosin filaments. The actin filaments themselves are sort of bound thing called the Z-line. And then in the resting state, before contraction has begun to occur, you have this space called the H zone, that is the distance between uh, the ends of the actin filaments. So I think those are kind of the high points of the anatomy. What you just need to realize is that when contraction occurs, all of everything here, all of these structures, they're going to begin to kind of move in closer together. The Z lines and the associated actin filaments are going to begin to kind of get pulled together. The myosin stays the same length, but it pulls the actin, actin in. And so what you're going to see as we move through a process of contraction, the A-band is going to stay the same length because the A-band is the length of this myosin, which doesn't really change. The H-zone is going to shrink and eventually disappear because we're going to see how actin comes closer and closer together. And similarly, the I-band is going to do the same thing as all of these structures, all of these individual sort of links in the chain uh, start to come together. So again, not the most sort of stimulating kind of thing, but I do think it's important to have, uh, have an awareness of that. Any questions there? And that will do it for myocyte contraction. In the remaining videos in this series, Dr. McGinnis will address cardiac rhythm disturbances and ultimately antiarrhythmic drug therapy. Stay tuned.